marka koobad waxaan rabaa inaan aad iyo aad in kaga mahad celiyo waqtigiina ee waxaan rabaa wax yarnaan qofka u baahda masquul albaab meesha laga baxay way masquusha geeska ku taala in case of emergency hadii uu dhaca ee the exit ka laga wada baxaya banaanka kor aad isugu tagay hadii in case of maarta emergency uu dhaca thank you very much thank you for coming hello everyone and good evening First, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today. And we pay, and I, and pay my respect to the elders present and the past. I believe most of you already know me. For those who, know, who don't know me, my name is Awais. I am one of the organizers of this meeting tonight. The focus of the meeting Uh, the focus of the meeting is to connect Somali professionals, university students, business owners, and, and, and like-minded people to gain their ideas and knowledge and important experiences. information and our guest speakers and qibradaha iyo fikradaha inagu ziyaadinayaan even tiga caawa ma u san noo hirgelin hadii ay san ahayn ee waqtigiina iyo timekiina macna had meesha aad ku imaadeen first i would like to thank our host for organizing this event the somali young professionals i just want to mention some of the boys who contributed their time and their effort to, and, and their time and their effort this event to be happen one of them if i forget your name please excuse me and i will talk to you later one of them master abdelnasir abdi he is one of the organizers they put the effort muhammad rahoy hassan and all the other boys and girls who contributed their time and their effort this event to happen i would like to thank our outstanding guest speakers for supporting this event here in Brisbane. First, I would like to thank Mr. Muhammad Aten, historian, author, photographer. Muhammad Aten, he came from UK just to, take, to come here and talk to us. Muhammad, thank you very much and thanks for your time to be here with us tonight. Our, our other guest speaker, our other guest speaker, Mohamed Ismail. Mohamed is a business owner, business consultant. He's from Melbourne, just to talk to us. And it's our, it, this is our opportunity to gain some information from all these talented guest speakers. I would like to welcome Fat uh, Fatuma Elmi. She is very talented, registered nurse, a mother of three of adults, masters of mental health, health, and registered nurse. Fatuma, thank you for your time and thanks to be with us. I would like to welcome Amina Abdi. She's one of a, she's she's a teacher of International Islamic College here in Brisbane. But uh, Amina, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. <laughs> Last but not least, Dr. Abdi Hussi. Everyone knows Dr. Abdi Hussi in, in Brisbane. He is one of the elders, one of the youth, and he is the connector of every, everywhere in Brisbane. Without Abdi Hussi, <laughs> without Abdi Hussi, we, we, it would be very hard for all of us like to be integrated, to connect each other. He is a researcher. He is an uh, author of a book. And thank you very much, Mr. Abdelhasi, to be with us. I think I'm going to ask you a question, Madam Akasuk, I'm going to ask you a question. 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 أخبارهم وحيابين نوضان إن سفعون لقيسنه نوتني والبكاقاته 
سؤالنا والويدين دورا وحي سؤال داد كقف معنا سؤال قبا قاسة نمبر رضها لغا قرطوها لغا هذا وحي وباهن information قاسة لك ليش مرك كوات وحارب عينا سو دويو one of our guest speakers حارب عينا سو دويو وحارب عين ليلة سو دويو مستر محمد عرتن thank you very much welcome السلام عليكم السلام عليكم مغليس كان كي يهيمي يا yeah? اوكي okay. uh, don't know how I'm going to do this <laughs> so my name is uh, محمد عبد الله عرتن are there any non somali speakers here انا سي وذكر اس كذا يا انا وذكر اس كذا uh, are there any non-Somali speakers? Any non-Somali speakers? Good. Okay, one. Any Anyone else? Two, three. Anybody else? <laughs> someone tried to put their hand on and someone slapped it down. <laughs> okay, um, I'll, I'll continue in Somali then in that, in that case, because I was, I was hoping if the, everybody was uh, a Somali speaker, I could do this presentation in essentially in, in, in Somali, but are there people who do not speak English here? So let me compromise a bit so I can bit of mix any non-English speakers, non-English speakers. Everybody speaks and understands English, right? Okay, good, Alhamdulillah. So as I said, my name is Mohammed Abdullahi Artan. Uh, I'm from the UK. I live there, work there. Uh, I'm not historian. Uh, what did he else? What did he? What did he mention me as? Author, publisher, all of those things. I haven't actually authored one thing. <laughs> I've published a lot of books, though. That's uh, that's true. I have a publication uh, company based in 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 the UK, Leicester, which specializes in African studies and Islamic studies. So we've published a lot of work in Somali and in English. Uh, I love history. Uh, as I say, I stalk history. I write a lot about the Somali history and the Somali experience. And a lot of what I do in terms of publishing books, history, much of what I'm going to uh, present tonight, and what I've been presenting in the past is around identity, i.e. Somali identity. And to understand your identity, you have to know where you came from and who you are. Okay, and that's why a lot of the Somali history uh, sessions are uh, uh, some of the most successful things that I've, I've actually ever done for the past year, year and a half. This has been very successful, alhamdulillah. But before I start, uh, I'm going to start with uh, a disclaimer. A lot of the things I'll be saying is around uh, history of the Somali people and where they live, and it might talk about Qabil here and there. Uh, do you guys know the, the story of uh, Haj Aden? I think he was Majartan. <laughs> do you guys know the story? Have you heard the story? Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, Hajjah is not quite okay. Well, you can Hajjah, you can say, I don't mind the mystery. Although, I will be glad to be here, I will be here. Because I don't know how many people are going to be here. And I don't know how many people are going to be here. And I don't know how many people are going to be here. I always used to hear that the story about Haj Aden was a story about an individual who people like to tell stories about. But I, through digging, I found out that this was an actual person who lived a century or so of years ago. And he was a millionaire and he was a trader. And he used to trade between Aden and what we call Bosasa and that type of area. And the story goes, I'll tell the joke because this is a joke. I don't know what is true about the story, but we'll have to, uh, you'll have to hear it to decide for yourself. Uh, so it goes, he used to buy a lot of stock from Yemen 
and traded over the channel, i.e. the Red Sea, that little hop that we have. And so a lot of the things that he used to buy and he used to sell in, in the Somali Peninsula would quickly sell out. So one, of the, one day he's actually ex overextended himself. He bought a lot of material, passed it down, sold a lot of them. And you know Somali is how we are. We take things on credit. So we didn't have enough money to pay back the man. Well, I'm explaining like this because that's how I understood it, but the Somalis have a different take of it. So the man kept asking, you know, Haji Adin, when are you coming over and bringing my money? So he would say, oh, today is Yom uh, al-Jum'ah, Majr al Safir, Jum'at al-Muslimin, Majr al Safir. Today is Friday, is uh, Friday of the believers of the Muslims. Majr al does not travel <laughs> on the Friday. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then he would say, okay, next day, Saturday, you know. And then he said, oh, Saturday, okay. Saturday is uh, Yom al, uh, Yom al um, what was it, uh, Yom al Yehud, I think. That's the day of Sabt, yeah, that's the, the Sabt. And that's the day of the Yehud, Majr does not travel. And then what about Sunday? And then Sunday, the Christ uh, sorry, the Christians, and Monday, the Zabur, and he finished the week, basically. And so the, <laughs> the, the crux of the story was that he never showed up, because the week finished like this. But what I understand for the, from the moral of the story, because we're talking about trading and business and networking, is that, and we're also talking about history here, is that the element of innovativeness and the element of having an historical uh, account that connects you with your land and your people. And for me, what connects this story is when I started digging up and finding out and interviewing people, one day I was telling my mother and she was like, yeah, that was my great, great grandfather. <laughs> you know, that's a story. So, alhamdulillah, I, I, I get to uh, find out who he was. And through that, I realized uh, the story and how that it connected with me. But I'm going to continue. Today, we're talking about the, is, the, the, the uh, history of the Somali Peninsula. Okay? And what I'm going to say today is a presentation around... Uh, the Somali history. So far, people have been asking me to present this topic, which I've designed to be a workshop. I've designed it to be a workshop around four or five hours. I've condensed it for the most of the time because you know a lot of people who are sitting here today are not able to sit through a four-hour session. So I condensed it. Uh, I condensed it, and I chose normally a section and each each science a a, a brief outline. So a geography, a brief outline, ethnography, a brief outline, theology, a brief outline, and so on and so on, and sociology, you know, and so on. But today what I chose to do is a bit unique. I chose to talk about trade and commerce specifically, the history on trade and commerce, because this is what we are talking about today. So uh, we will talk about theology, trade, and Somali uh, sultanates and its demise. Why are we doing that? Because trade links, a lot of Somali history's trade links with religiosity. The concept of belonging with a bigger framework, i.e. this time with the Muslim networks, okay? Around the medieval period, okay? And this is the type, and we have to understand, if we want to understand the trade and the history of the Somalis, we have to understand this bit, okay? So, theology. To understand a bit of uh, the deen of the Somalis, we have to go back a bit, a couple of thousand years. Do we know the concept of waq? And this is an actual qu question. Concept of waq. Do we know waq? Anybody? Odayasha, <laughs> So the young, young minds. Any, anybody know the concept of waq? Anybody? Don't be shy. Yes, go ahead. Huh? God. Yes? Okay, that's the uh, understanding of God. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so this is the word for God or ilah, what is known as uh, back in the day. Because we know this word waq and its belief system, because we share a common ancestry in terms of a language. The Somali language is not unique on its own. 
the Somali language goes into a, something called the Afro-Asiatic languages, i.e. the Cushitic languages. And these Cushitic languages have about 24 branches. And one of these branches is the Somali, the Afar, the Rendile, the Saha, the Oromo. Do we know these names? We know them, yeah? So these people are the people that we share commonality with. And if you look at East Africa, generally, all these languages have a concept of waq. Okay, they all have a concept of waq, okay? And if you look at that, we know from the word waq, as we say waq, or uh, uh, waqa, or uh, waqfana, as, as, as the Oromos uh, call it, is uh, the Cushitic language of the East Africa, which means sky god, to believe in a god system, or a god that is distinctively not part of this realm, not part of this world. So there is no uh, asnam for it, there is no statues for it, there is no deity that you uh, uh, look at, there are no, in essence, temples and buildings. That's why they say trees had for the Somalis a lot of meaning, in the sense that the trees was the concept of a templehood, a concept of masjid, a concept of where people worshipped God, okay? That is where the Somalis stayed at. This is how we uh, uh, worshipped it. And we can see it from the Rendile, for example. We can see it from the, uh, the uh, Oromo before they became Muslim, because Oromo were one of the last of the Cushitic peoples to embrace Islam. And so we can see from these traditions that these people and these traditions have shared this common link. So if I move from uh, the, the, the concept of understanding Waq, you can see from our language, for example, what we say, wankal, watqana, wankal. Wankal is to slaughter, to, uh, to basically uh, uh, a sacrifice, right? This is the origin of the word, which is waqlal, and then it, it came from a shortened ver a version of waq local, okay? So this is a sacrifice for waq. So, uh, so wankal is one of them, uh, the waq is one of them. We know the word the waq comes from two combined words, which is leh waq. This means in another word, pray to God or to make dua, for example, okay? And as time passed, these two words has changed. This is how you know when language, this is what uh, linguists say, that languages, when they are developing, they get shortened. Things that were longer and that were joined together, sorry, that were separate uh, and had a separate meanings, get to, uh, uh, get to be joined together and then a meaning completely changes. And that's why the concept of toko, uh, the toko or tokasho comes from the same concept from waq. I don't know whether you guys understand this because the Somali says, they do not say, let's, let's pray salah. Okay, other, other kind, uh, languages like the Persians, for example, they say namaz, for example, right? So the Somalis, they say tukasho, and the tukasho is linked with the tuka, and the tuka is the, the deity of, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, the animal that served as a sort of an icon for worship and understanding God. So wakoyi, for example, is, comes from the uh, word of upper sky. Barwako comes from a similar thing to uh, wakla, is godless, garwaksi, give wak his due. And then we know from the Somali uh, cities that we know, for example, uh, like Awud Wak, uh, what other cities do we have? El Wak, what other cities? Someone is from El Wak there, immediately. <laughs> what else, the other cities do we have? Galwak. Okay. What do you mean? Galwak at the world. So, could you send Listiga? Listiga, or go back Somewhere, somewhere, okay. Somewhere. Okay. Uh, then we have Qabils, for example, Bidawak. Then we have Dinti Wak. Then we have Galadwak. Then we have Wak Barre. We have Wak Dore. We have Suwakron. And etc. and such. We know these tribes. I'm not making them up. Uh, so these are some of the aspects of how certain Somali clans are actually named after Waq, for example, okay? And this is uh, part of the uh, uh, rich tradition and cultures that we have. So then we jump into the time of pre-Islam, just before the dawn of Islam, pre-dawn of Islam. We know that, for example, when we talk about uh, Surat al-Fil, 
Alam Tarakev of Allah Rabbuka be as Habil Fil, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala say, the story of Abraha and everything and how the story came about, okay? We understand that, right? The story comes about that Yemen is ruled by the Aksumite emperor or the Aksumite king, and he stayed there for quite some time because at the north, the Persians ruled there, and at the, uh, uh, at the west is the Byzantine Roman kingdom that ruled. And then you had on the south, where is you now Ethiopia, Somalia, Djibouti, and all these bits, that's where they ruled uh, uh, um, uh, the, the Aksumite Empire, and some of South Yemen. Okay, so we know that uh, the, the king called Caleb in the Greek uh, literature, but in the... Uh, um, uh, in the uh, uh, Gilles uh, uh, Amharic is called uh, Ela. He was the one that invaded that land. And th so therefore we know from there on, when he sent the invasion, we have a Greek records that tell us that a force of about 120,000 people was transport transported from East Africa to invade Yemen. And about 20 to 30,000 of them were from Berbera. Okay? So... When I talk about this, people, uh, this section, people say, oh, you made us, us a part of the Ashab al-Fil, people who were cursed. <laughs> but this is tarikh, you know, you have to understand a, a bit of your uh, uh, history and background. And so these people were actually uh, part of the expedition that was sent in that period. And therefore, the uh, Kashitic people, whether they were Afar, they were the Somalis and stuff, that were part of that, uh, uh, um, envoy that has been sent to the Yemen to conquer, conquered and stayed for a while. And after Abraha came, and Abraha tried to conquer the, uh, the Hijaz, especially Mecca, and every uh, uh, they died off basically. What happened in essence was many of the soldiers, many of the people who were part of that invasion, they stayed there. They they stayed behind. So that's why we have stories like. For example, uh, Bilal, for example, who is not a Habashi, people say he's an Habashi, he's Habashi. He, his father was an Arab Yemeni, as we know the, the history. His mother was an Habashi, okay? Not his father. But if you look at it, his father also comes from a mixed descent family. And that mis mixed descent family comes from these soldiers and, uh, and peoples, okay? And so this is when the time the Prophet sends the Sahaba, to East Africa. In essence, this is the first time that Islam comes to East Africa then. This is the history that we have. And that's, that's, when, that's why people say Zayla, there is this mosque called Qiblatayn. Okay? And so we move on, fast forward 1400 years. Uh, basically, third of the world Muslim population is in Africa. Uh, almost half of Africa is Muslims. And obviously, 98 to 99%, I'm not saying, or oh, maybe even more than that, are Muslims in terms of Somalia, uh, Djibouti, and other places. And so the tradition continues. Uh, then the first time that we know that Muslims come again to East Africa, specifically Mogadishu, that we have records, is the time of Umar bin Khattab, anh, that uh, an, uh, uh, an army is sent to uh, to Mogadishu, and they land in Mogadishu by the a guy by the uh, by the name of Musa ibn Umar al Adham, who was the general for the Umayyad king or the Umayyad caliph by Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Okay, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. That's when they land, and that's when they come to Mogadishu. The reason that they do is because a bunch of refugees left the Middle East and they came to East Africa. They came to East Africa. So East Africa then starts setting this trend where actually if there is a conflict in Persia, if there is a conflict in the Middle East, if there is a conflict in most of these advanced, rich societies and cultures, you come to East Africa and you settle in East Africa. And this is, has been the norm. And obviously people will never come to somewhere which is a desert and uh, 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 somewhere where you can't actually live. And that's why you have immediately uh, short while after that, uh, quite a lot of export of slaves and slavery happens in from the Swahili coast, from the Somali coast, and they all go to Basra and Iraq. Okay, we know from uh, the history of Islam, for example, that these people started killing one uh, a lot of uh, people who were working in the in the in the in the. 
uh, what is it called, the marshlands. So a lot of people died. About 6,000 would average one day die. And so they revolt, they fight back, and they call this the Zench Rebellion, the Black People's Rebellion. For eight years, they've been fighting the Abbasid uh, dynasty, and they overthrew the Abbasid dynasty, one of the richest and the most powerful dynasties in Islamic history. Okay? And so we continue. And about the 7th century Hijri, which is 13th century, Ibn Battuta comes, and then he goes into basically, and says when he goes to Sudan, Yemen, and then to Zayla, then to Mogadishu, then Mombasa, and then Kilwa, all these places he visits, he learns one thing, that the trade is very dynamic. People are trading a lot of materials. There's a lot of people coming to Mogadishu, a lot of people coming to Zayla, selling and buying. And so there is, an, there is a tradition of scholarship where people are actually uh, if they can't afford students, young students, if they can't afford to buy and to be able to go to university, there are actually rich people paying for their education. Okay? So the early on, we have student bursaries. Today we talk about student loans, student bursaries. This is, has been actually a tradition, according to Ibn Battuta when he sees it, that has been established about seven, eight hundred years ago in our part of the world. And so the trade network that forms early on is just like the Silk Road. I don't know whether you know the Silk Road trade, uh, which connected Asia, Africa, and Europe. The same thing consisted with the Red Sea trade network, which is basically what we know as the, uh, the Yemen part of the world and the Somali Peninsula of, uh, uh, of the world. So the Babylonians, the Romans, the Greeks, they used to come there and trade with the Somalis. They would buy. And we know from a book called Prevalence of the Eritrean Sea, which is a Greek author who, uh, who's written it 1,950 1, years ago. He, he came to Zayla, he came to Barbara, he saw, he traded with the people, he talked about the people. And so this is actually in, in record that quite early on Somalia has been uh, settled and trading with the people. And he mentions what kind of materials you could actually trade with the Somalis and buy from. And from there on, we know that the products that were being traded was frankincense, myrrh, uh, 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 and spices, okay? And same thing goes with the uh, Egyptians earlier on. Uh, there is a queen by the name of Hatshep Sut. Do we know her? Anybody? Bukurad the Hatshep Sut, Lord of Mamakashan. Mamakashan. Or Masari the Ahead. Yeah? Okay, basically, either way at Kofta Borada or also the Tegeska Africa, I'm a look at Somali, the Edictamanta. She sent an envoy, a shipment of envoys, so that they can trade with her. That is the picture of the queen of the land of Punt and the king of the land of Punt that has been documented as part of the uh, hieroglyph. Uh, so it, it shows that in, in their writings on the wall that this has been uh, um, uh, the people that they've been trading with. And she, she's she been on, on, on the record to say that she came from there, her origin and her family came from. So you know when Somalis ask, Oh, how much is Somali do hey kasu jeda masarida? Somali do hey kasu jeda kan. Or to, by the way, please, I do to Bahasha Murkadama to Bernamish Kiala, didn't so my kicks with Jeda. So I'll have to ask us. Tona Kijua is what Hela has done. You should ask Somali the Yaka for Amai. Somali the Kekas of Amai in Taladai. You should ask Yaka for Amai. May Fantin. Ms. Rosanna. So you should actually be the one that takes the tradition, the ownership to that tradition, and say, people came from there, cultures came from us, people traded with us, not from who we came from, who we traded with, yeah? So we can see from this uh, story that she thinks that the pharaohs and Fara'in actually come from them, rather than the other way around, that they actually come from them, okay? And so, uh, true to the stories, that you know, the, the people uh, um, uh, uh, have understood us, that she have sailed on the sea, making a good start for God's land, that's what they considered Punt as, making landfall safely at the train of Punt. There are about 31 uh, trees that they have taken from the land to plant it in Cairo. This first recorded, historical uh, recorded uh, in essence, according to uh, some histor uh, historians, that people actually transported material from our land 
and they moved it to other part to to try to grow it there to make their life easier so that they don't have to come back and trade again you know that's the innovative mind of trading right okay so to move on uh, some some of these words I just give you an example so that you can actually look at it. These are some loan words that the Somalis have, which are uh, either in their origin Egyptian or in their origin Somali and then borrowed from the Egyptians. You never know who came first. Okay, so you can you can uh, say that next time you say ayeyo, you might be using an Egyptian word, or the Egyptians might have been using your word. You never know. So the ancient Egyptians, Greeks, and Arabs also believed that the cinnamon was produced in Somali Peninsula. This is not the case, because we know the cinnamon is not a naturally something that is uh, a part of the Somali. It comes from, usually, Indonesia, your neck of the world. world you know, this is, uh, and it's very peculiar how f far that trade system is, because if you look at that, and you look at the Somali Peninsula, that's quite a, a, a long route. And that's why the Egyptian, uh, sorry, the Roman uh, writer around about uh, that time period has come to the conclusion to say, no, these people were very smart. They locked down the trade. So they, they, they actually made sure that this trade for the cinnamon, it so uniquely comes from their land. Everybody comes there because it's a strategic route. Everybody comes there, everybody buys from them, and everybody exports from there. People think then it comes from them. And that's why early on they started writing that cinnamon comes from there. Cinnamon comes from there. But which is not the case. He ruined our, our uh, monopoly on cinnamon. <laughs> okay. Uh, then after that, around about the 12th century, we have the, uh, the Chinese trade link. Uh, anybody know the uh, famous uh, Maritimer, Cheng Ho or Zheng Ho? Zheng He? Does anybody know him? No? Okay. Um, he was a uh, general uh, for the Ming dynasty. He traveled through that route that you can see, the line that you can see uh, from there all the way. He traveled to Mogadishu, he traveled to Barawa, he traveled to Malindi. He went all of these places and traded with the people. Uh, he made uh, sure that that animal that we know as uh, Giri, right? Or Giri Sahma. Uh, uh, it's basically, it's, it's been even argued that the word, the Chinese word, which is kilin, is a borrow word from the Somali language, because obviously this, uh, this, this animal comes from the uh, South Somali Peninsula, North uh, Kenyan part of the world, right? And so it's unique to that. It's not unique anywhere else. You can't find it anywhere else. So that shows you early on that uh, due to uh, uh, the influence that these people had in terms of trade and network, they found this animal very peculiar. This animal means quite a lot in the myth mythology of the Chinese, okay? The Chinese mythology, this animal is really important, but it's, it's not natural. So when the uh, general on the maritime found out the, the, that there is an animal like this in Bangladesh of all places, Okay, uh, and I can explain to you why he would see that in Bangladesh. But would, when he found it in Bangladesh, he was, you know, very curious, and he said, "Where does this animal come from?" And that's when they told him about Mogadishu and Barawa and all these places. And that's when the Chinese uh, uh, envoy went to uh, that area. And this is about 80 to 90 years after Ibn Battuta showed up. Uh, so before Ibn Battuta showed up. So this is sort of after Ibn Battuta's time. Okay. Uh, so, we know that uh, uh, the, the, the Chinese records say that their memoir described the Somali coast as, uh, as uh, heaped up stones. So, there were two, three floors of house buildings, Somali buildings, or Somali uh, engineering uh, construction system was such that, you know, it was marveled at. Later on, when the Portuguese show up, Run about this time, run about the Chinese time that they showed up, 1550 after Imam Ahmed Guri's time. When the Chinese show, I'm sorry, when the Portuguese show up and they see uh, the building uh, infrastructure of Mogadishu and Barawa and all these places, the first thing that they do, the first thing that they do, they do not get off, they do not do nothing, is to bombard this place, okay, from their ships. First thing is like, oh, what, who lives there? Muslims. Muslims live there. That's a trade network that goes to the, uh, India. Yeah, 
destroy it. This is a, a, a categorical, uh, it, no, it was, an, it was a mission statement that they had. Every coastal area for trading networks destroy it if it's owned by Muslims. Because why? What happens is then basically your trade system, your network system, can be destroyed and they, they can replace it with their own network system. And this is how the Portuguese as well as the Spanish start going out into the world in the 14th, 15th century. And that's when we have the transatlantic slavery that's been exported all the way to the Americas, the so-called discovery of America, as well as the, uh, the discovery of the route of uh, Cape of Hope, Cape, Cape of Hope in South Africa. And so this has happened in that, uh, in that uh, uh, limelight, okay? Uh, so we know then also from the trade network then we talked about now on the coast, what about the uh, inner lands, like hinterlands, for example? What, what networks were there within the African systems? We know golds that were being mined in Mali were being exported in in, in Zayla and in Mogadishu, they were being essentially sold and exported in that part of the world. Give me a second. Thank you, yeah. So they were being exported and sold in that part of the world, okay? So we know that, for example, the first coins to circulate in Europe since Roman times were minted from the gold of Mali and they were exported and bought from um, uh, Barawa, uh, Zayla, and, 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 and Mogadishu and these, and these type of places, okay? And it went on and on and on. And one historian, actually, one Arab historian who showed up in the 12th century, 12th century by the name of Shamsuddin uh, Abu Abdullah. He's an Arab geographer and historian. He said in that uh, sentence that in Zayla, gold is so plentiful that it's worth no more than iron. So iron is actually uh, 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 more valuable at that time. And the reason being is because we know the, that, as we said, there were mines in, in Mali, and these mines, there were being a lot of gold exported, and these exports were coming through the Somali Peninsula, but there were not enough mines for metal, okay, and iron. So because there were not enough for that, actually the demand became much more. Like for example, if you needed utensils, if you needed swords, if you needed the basic stuff you need for uh, uh, to 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 continue with. Um, um, so same thing by uh, the uh, the uh, Portuguese uh, 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 discovery, he says both sides of the Red Sea, Moors, Moors are here Muslims, black Muslims he means, had complete control over long distance trade, okay? And this is some of the things that they uh, tried to uh, 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 undo and destroy because obviously you don't want that. And so the East Africans developed and maintained close ties with the Muslim outposts in the Indian Ocean, uh, ports uh, and the Persian Gulf and India. There is a whole tradition of in, uh, 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 black Muslims, black East African Muslims, actually going to India. And one of the first people to actually uh, go uh, part of the conquest when Pakistan was being conquered early on with the Muslim empire we talked, to, talked about, huge junk of them was part of that was from East Africa as the army that went in there, okay? Uh, uh, by the, uh, a general by the name of Muhammad uh, Ibn Qasim al thaqafi who was the nephew of Hajjaj Ibn Yusuf, we know Hajjaj Ibn Yusuf, is the one that conquered Pakistan. And when he went there to, to actually uh, conquer Pakistan or Blad the Sindh as they called it, he took a lot of army from Mogadishu and that part of the world. Not many know. And then in the 4th, 12th, 13th, 14th century, huge junk of these people were actually going to Gujarat. They were working there, they were trading, but some of them were actually slaves, some of them worked with the empires. And then essentially what you have and that built in India is a, a unique African, black African society that were Muslim, that were running uh, some of the Muslim sultanates or that were part of the army essentially running the sultanate. And one famous one was Malik Ambar. I don't know whether you guys know Malik Ambar. Malik Ambar is supposedly an Oromo. Uh, he was uh, captured as a young boy uh, from Zayla and then all the way to India. He went all the way to India, Gujarat. He grew up, he became an army general. He conquered the whole uh, uh, southern part of uh, Gujarat. And, and that's a an whole tradition. I'm not gonna go into it now. Uh, 
this is quite important uh, a recent uh, couple of years discovery that this relates to you people in down under okay this relates to you people in, in australia so we're talking about the connection of east africans with indonesia earlier on right this is a clear connection with kilwa which is modern day tanzania for example and east africa actually showing that you know there was actually uh, a heritage from this part of the world, i.e. East Africa, with Australia, okay? So you can see that early on that these coins that were being produced and minted in Kilwa or elsewhere in East Africa are found in, in Australia, which is uh, apparently, based on this quote, uh, uh, the oldest foreign objects ever found in Australia. Okay, there's actually, this is the oldest foreign objects ever found in Australia. And these are coins that are minted in our part of the world, people traded in, people walked around with it, and people used it. And it might have been something that uh, uh, one of the uh, natives here were actually using to buy material from Muslim traders who showed up, vice versa, you never know. Or the natives might have been uh, traveling all the way there. Allah Allah. So the Somali Sultanates we know uh, quite a lot about their history, okay? So these sultanates are, during the Middle Ages, uh, uh, some of the most proper, uh, prosperous sultanates. The, the Mogadishu Sultanate we talked about extensively earlier on. I'm gonna move on. And then there is uh, the, the Ajuran uh, Sultanate, which is known to have uniquely have had irrigation system. And we know irrigation system shows an advantaged uh, engineering capacity. They had a damming system, a, a dam system. Uh, they had uh, a standing army. They had a, a women generals, okay? And so the, all of this is part of the uh, Somali history and the Somali uh, people that have uh, lived there. Um, then later on, um, uh, the, 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 the Oromo uh, peoples from uh, the highlands of Ethiopia uh, um, uh, actually come down and then they start going on conquering uh, spree. So just like the, the Mongols did back in the day uh, on the back of horses, the Oromos went on the back of horses and cam camels and started doing a, a conquering spree. And they were able to do this because the Christian uh, uh, empire or the Christian Ethiopian Empire was very weak with the Muslim sultanates, that, uh, like the Ifat, for example, Ifat Sultanate, uh, Adal Sultanate, all these, they became very weak because they had an internal uh, battle for close to three centuries, 200 uh, something uh, years. So people do not talk about this period of time, but people like to focus on a similar problem that has happened in the Middle East, which was the Crusades. We know the Crusades involved a lot of Europeans, it involved a lot of Arabs, it involved a lot of Africans, it involved a lot of Asians, and it involved a lot of people. But similarly, with the Somali uh, and the East African uh, uh, somewhat Crusades, or what you call uh, Jihad versus Crusades, the, this lasted similarly 200, 230, 240 years, but there's no coverage for that. In conclusion, okay? The collapse of uh, Islamic rule in Spain, what we know of Granada, uh, Cordobo, and the expulsion of Muslims from that part of the world facilitated that a lot of Muslims would leave Spain. And then they came to Africa. Many of the people, again, that come from that beautiful society, that rich, you know, when Muslims talk about the peak of Muslim society, peak of Muslim uh, civilization, we talk about Spain the beauty, the technological marvel and everything and the knowledge of it. A lot of these people actually moved from there. They were pushed out of there and they settled in what we know as Morocco today, uh, Algeria and these type of people. But many other tribes also f settled in Mogadishu as well. So this has created that by uh, 15 uh, or 12, the Christian rulers who issued that they're not going to allow any Muslims and any Jews in their land made sure that they get out of there and then they, these people looked for places to settle and many uh, settled around these African coasts and many others elsewhere. And the same thing goes with the uh, Columbus when he went around and start uh, uh, conquering and, and destroying. This is a quote from uh, Barbosa, who was a uh, 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 Portuguese uh, 
uh, maritime. Uh, uh, he talked about what happened to uh, uh, Barawa and how it, you know it's trade and everything else. But later on, they completely decide to destroy that because what what they want for themselves, as we said again and again, is they want that conquest. They want that. Uh, part of the trade and the only way you do is you subdue or destroy what was before you you don't supplement you don't agree with people so they wanted to take things by force and they were able to do that and that's why a lot of the somali rich heritage and culture as well as the engineering skill and marvel has been destroyed zayla alone are is in in record to have been destroyed 17 times 17 times Okay, and this we're talking about at least last thousand years. So this is a city that is so old and that we know, and many of times uh, we do not know what it means to the Somali psyche. Holy, holy, had that was the